Well, hello everybody. It's uh, super good news to welcome today uh, Stuart Soroka at the CSDC Speaker Series. Uh, as we just said, we pushed uh, out the talk uh, to May 2021 because we were sure about a year ago that uh, we could be back to in-person meetings. Alas, the bad news is that this is not possible. Well, you see the theme here that I'm trying to build up. For those who do not know, Stuart has been one of the earliest members of the CSDC back 15 years ago when Elizabeth Sorry, Elizabeth uh, founded the center and uh, he has taught at McGill over 12 years before the bad news hit and we had to say our goodbye to him with a hockey shirt to uh, of the Canadian and uh, I'm gonna post a little bit of a memory here for you of that very special um, moment um, uh, to, for you to see. Uh, that was our moment uh, of uh, the hockey shirt that was uh, being given uh, to Stuart uh, at the time uh, when he was on his way to Michigan. So that's the unofficial part uh, of the introduction. Officially, uh, Stuart is currently the uh, Michael Traugott Professor of Communication and Media and Political Science at the University of Michigan and a research professor in the Center for Political Studies at the Institute for Social Research. But uh, the University of Michigan has to also find a goodbye gift soon. I'm not sure if they will come up with an equally good one because this summer Stuart will join the Department of Communications uh, at the University of California, Los Angeles. So these are wonderful news for UCLA and for Stuart and many congrats from us. Stuart's academic interests seem uh, to have been shifted lately. Uh, as you know, he started out to focus on negative news, negativity bias and news selections, anger, fear, disgust, sensitivity, negative effects of diversity on welfare state attitudes and so on, but probably had enough of this uh, negativity and switched recently to more positive themes such as positive news. Uh, I'm not sure that they exist, but I think we will find out. More seriously, Stuart has made enormous contribution to the study of framing effects, news consumption, uh, information society more generally, as well as to the study of uh, public opinion and policy dynamics, of course, as well as diverse societies. It would be impossible to list all of his specific contributions here, but I'm using a shortcut, a quantitative measure uh, to uh, talk about his accomplishments. Uh, he has published seven books, uh, 84 peer reviewed articles and nearly 30 book chapters amongst the highly placed articles. Uh, we know he has published in PNES, PLOS, APSR and BJPS and political communications amongst many others. Today, Stuart will talk to us about positive news, particularly his work with uh, Jana Kropnikov, as I imagine about the increasing viability of positive news, which is set to be published, or maybe it is just about to be published uh, by Cambridge Elements in Politics and Communication and Cambridge University Press. So welcome Stuart, we've missed you and we look forward to your talk. Thank you, Dylan, for that kind introduction. There's no possible way I can live up to that. Uh, I, I'm going to share my screen and get my slides running, and then I will dig in. OK, people can see those slides. I'm hoping you'll stop me if you cannot. I'm going to assume everybody can. Uh, thank you very much for having me. I, I'm, I'm really I'm grateful for the opportunity to say this step out loud, talking through it is useful. Um, and also I'm really grateful for the opportunity to get excellent feedback. I, I'm sure it's gonna be excellent feedback because this talk is in large part a talk, like a follow-up talk to what I gave at the center, uh, I'm gonna say about, about seven years ago in the spring of 2014. I got great feedback at, at that time. And that too was a presentation about the, the valence of news coverage. 
I, I promise you, I do sometimes think about other things, but, but this project <laughs> is one that for me is very closely linked to Montreal, not just because the first book was written there and capitalized on the good advice by my many colleagues there, many of whom are here today, but also because Patrick Fournier and I have continued to work on the subject for, uh, for the seven years since. And so a lot of what follows draws on my work with, as you will see, my, my work with Patrick, as well as the, the many, many hours of conversation that we had traveling around to run experiments back when traveling was a thing that happened. Uh, uh, that, that's the first thing I want to say. Uh, second, you should know that this talk's based on a, a short book manuscript written with Yana Krupnikov at SUNY Stony Brook and forthcoming with Cambridge. As Dietwin said, it's an attempt to reconsider some of our thinking about negativity biases in news content and political behavior, informed partly by research that Yana and I had done on differences in the tone of coverage circulated on different social media. Um, but it's also a response to the pandemic and the Black Lives Matter movement, um, particularly the kind of spike in attentiveness to Black Lives Matter following the death of George Floyd. Uh, Yana and I started talking about trends in news coverage and about the summer of 2020, and, and then we wrote this thing. Third, before we start, uh, the book is called The Increasing Viability of Positive News, but as a talk title, I really like the mood is the message as the title of the talk. It's a, a tweak, as I'm sure most of you know, on Marshall McLuhan's, the medium is the message, and the graphic that you're looking at here, and the color theme is from the cover of, of that book. So too is the incorrect spelling of message as massage. The story is that McLuhan noticed this copy editing error in the page proofs and decided to keep it. Uh, and I, I don't know if that story is true, but, but the notion that the mood or the valence of a message is a, if not the central feature of a message, fits nicely with what I'm about to talk about. What I'm about to talk about is exclusively about the valence of content, not really the subject matter of content, premised on the notion that the valence of information, not just news, but the valence of information is one of the very first, if not the very first thing that our brain recognizes, and thus a major factor in our decision to be attentive or inattentive to that information. I shouldn't use the word decision. That makes it sound like it's something that we actively decide. It is not. It is something that our brain just does for us. More on that later. Fourth, before I start, I want to say I'm going to break all kinds of rules about presentations. You're all looking at computer monitors, uh, and I intend to take uh, advantage of that. I'm going to put a lot on your screen, and I'm going to spend very little time on the methodology of things, too. I'm just going to burn through a bunch of studies, complicated graphics, and I hope you'll tolerate the kind of uh, fast descriptions and the tiny graphics. I'm, I'm happy to try to correct all my errors in uh, or fill in gaps in the, in the discussion. And fifth and finally, I want you to know um, I know many of you are political scientists, and I think that's a totally reasonable academic pursuit, but, but the talk I'm about to give you is not going to be especially political science-y. I'm going to play with a talk that is much, that is political communication, but it's much more communication, communication than it is political. And that isn't to say that there aren't important implications of what I'm about to say for politics. Um, I am, after all, focusing on political news for almost the entire talk, but I'm not really going to get to the political implications of what I'm talking about. I'm going to focus on the kind of communication implications of what I'm talking about and hope that you can live with that and we can talk about the politics of it um, afterwards as you're interested. So now that I've burned up a lot of time introducing things, let's start with, um, let's dive right into some content. I want to start by looking at the tone of recent U.S. news content, and I'm going to show you the tone of coverage in seven U.S. newspapers over the first seven months of 2020. These are the data that got Jana and I starting to think about this book, the period during which we saw the, the COVID pandemic, of course, and increased attention to the Black Lives uh, Black Lives Matter movement. Now, how much content during that time focused on these issues? If you look in the top panel right now, what you have is the proportion of all news stories in these seven major U.S newspapers, the proportion of all stories that, that mentioned more than once, so twice or more, uh, the, in, in some form, the COVID pandemic. We, you know, we reach a point in uh, March and April where 80% of all the stories in all newspapers at, reference COVID more than once. What, what does the volume of Black Lives Matter coverage look like? It looks like that. You have this spike uh, just at the end of May, and we reach a point where, again, 
over half of news coverage at that time references Black Lives Matter in one form or another. Now, these are overlapping, right? You can, there are many stories that mention both the coronavirus and the Black Lives Matter movement, particularly when there are marches going on and we're all concerned about masks and things like this. But uh, what I'm gonna do is, is treat the Black Lives Matter stories as, as one unit, treat the COVID stories as another unit, albeit overlapping units, and then I'm gonna have all the other stories, the stories that don't mention Black Lives Matter more than once, the stories that don't mention COVID more than once. I'm just gonna call them other stories. And now what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna look at the average tone uh, over this time period of all of those stories. I'm gonna plot da daily values, those are circles, and I'm gonna plot rolling averages, and those are the lines, and the kind of beigey uh, color are Black Lives Matter stories, and the white, these are COVID stories, and the gray are other stories. And I want to highlight, um, I want to highlight two things here. Uh, the the first is that uh, obviously COVID stories and then Black Lives Matter stories are more negative than the other stories. So these are news stories that occurred in 2020 that were negative. They were relatively negative. This is measured, by the way, using a a dictionary-based sentiment tool that use that looks across all the words and in, in all of the coverage in these newspapers over time. And I'm happy to talk in detail afterwards about the value of different sentiment tools, um, machine learning versus um, dictionary-based and so on. But for now, just accept that this is a dictionary-based sentiment tool that I'm, I'm gonna use. And it produces roughly the same estimates as other dictionary-based sentiment tools and roughly the same estimates as other, as, as machine learning algorithms as well. So you see that when COVID appears, it appears as a highly, highly negative story. And then you see that the half-life of that negativity is about a month. That is within a month, maybe five or six weeks, half of the negativity in a COVID stories has dissipated. And COVID stories become in that kind of April period, not noticeably more negative than say stories, other stories were in January, where in January, other stories is all stories. And in fact, during that period, what you see is not only the COVID stories become more positive, but the other content becomes highly positive, the stuff that isn't about COVID. So if you're reading the news in April 2020, what you have is news coverage that if, on, if anything, on balance, is a little more positive than it was in January 2020, in spite of the fact that we are in the midst of a major pandemic. You look at the Black Lives Matter movement, there obviously the um, increased attentiveness leads to very, very negative stories. And the half-life of that negativity is about two weeks. Two weeks later, Black Lives Matter stories are not noticeably more negative than say COVID stories were a month into the pandemic. And they stay at that more negative than COVID, more negative than all other stories, but at this kind of half as negative as they initially were level. So there is a kind of spike in attentiveness and highly negative coverage when these two things, the pandemic and the Black Lives Matter movement um, happen, but that negativity dissipates. And that was, a, that was a pattern that Jan and I became very interested in because it didn't seem to us in at the end of March, let's say 2020 or the, all through April, or for that matter, all through May or June or July, and in fact, beyond that, we've now seen, it just doesn't make sense that COVID stories are not super negative. It's a pandemic. That was the, that, that was the kind of thinking that got us to, to start this book project, focused on the tendency for news to be negative, not in these cases permanently, but negative temporarily, and then for that negativity to dissipate. Now, news on average is still mildly negative. This is not to say that news is it is in the middle of the pandemic highly positive, just to say that it, the, the magnitude of the negativity that each of these events begins with dissipates pretty quickly. Now you might be saying, okay, but, but what you're talking about is news coverage at the end of four years of the Trump presidency, and news is so incredibly negative at this point that what we've lost is the kind of longer term trend, that what we're seeing here are adjustments within a period that already is highly, highly negative in comparison with all periods before that. If you looked 10 years prior or 20 years prior or 30 years prior, you would see a very different complexion. At the, when, when we look at the tone of news coverage. And it's because of the particular context in which we find ourselves that news, that this news about Black Lives Matter 
and COVID looks the way it does. Well, I wanna, I wanna convince you that that's not the case. I wanna convince you that actually news now is no more negative uh, than, it, than it was 30 years ago. So let's look at a longer term trend in the balance of news coverage. And this time we'll use a different data source for fun. You get the same thing if you do newspapers, but let's look at all television, all major network television news content from 1990 to the present. So this is not some of it, it's all of it. It's the population of stories that appeared on ABC, CBS, or NBC news programs from 1990 until midway through 2020. It's every single story. And every single story is then automatically coded for sentiment. And what I'm going to do is take averages over months. And let's just look overall at what that kind of average looks like of news sentiment over months. Note first, that there are increases and decreases in this in this time series at predictable times. Okay, overall news is negative, not positive, so it's below the zero line, which is the kind of neutral point in this in the sentiment measure. And we see downward spikes at the Oklahoma City bombing and following 9/11, and when the Charlie Hebdo offices are attacked, and when and then a kind of and, when, and then we see some negativity through. Trump selection and COVID and so on. We also see a very, very highly positive spike when Obama is elected, for instance. I, th that, that isn't critical to the argument I'm making, uh, I'm making here today, but it's, nice, uh, it's a nice illustration of the concurrent validity of the sentiment measure. And the fact that it moves in predictable ways is, is good news for me as someone who now would like to use the sentiment measure to say something else. The thing that matters here, as in for this talk, is that there's no long-term downward trend in the tone of news coverage. There's movement around an equilibrium. That equilibrium is a little bit negative, and then there's movement around that equilibrium. The average tone of news coverage a few months ago was not fundamentally different from the average tone of news coverage in 1990 or 1995 or 2000 and so on and so on. So why has there not been a secular decline in the valence of news coverage. I'm gonna to present to you a three-part argument. And the first two parts offer what I hope is a reasonable explanation for why we see this relatively stable equilibrium in the valence of news coverage rather than a steady downward trend. And the third part does more than explain this historical data, I hope. It, it suggests, we think, that we may see an upward shift in the overall tone of news coverage in the future. That is, rather than descend into negativity, positive news may become more prevalent. Here's our three-part argument. This is the format of the rest of the talk. Part one, valence-based asymmetries vary over time. I'm gonna draw on three different ideas, outlying this novelty and adaptive processing to make the argument that we should see valence-based asymmetries, preferences for negative or positive information, vary systematically over time based on context in part. Part two, valence based asymmetries vary across individuals. We're gonna look at experiments on new selection tasks. We're gonna draw on some data that Patrick and I gathered on psychophysiological experiments. And I'm gonna demonstrate that at any given moment in time, there also was a lot of diversity in valence based preferences. And even as there is a majority that may be interested in negative con content, there is a significant minority of people at any given moment that is interested or more activated or more attentive to positive content. And then this is the really important part. Part three, technology facilitates diverse news platforms catering to diverse preferences. And there I'm gonna talk about changes in media outlets and, uh, and technological affordances and the hybrid media environment. And this is important because the other two things have always been true. The other two things can't account for why we expect to see some change in the future. The other two things just account for what's been going on, this kind of movement around an equilibrium. We want to argue that that equilibrium may shift upwards. And that equilibrium may shift upwards because of part three. But it's going to take me forever to get to part three. So here we go. I'm going to dig right in. The first argument is relatively straightforward. It's not novel. What if our focus on negativity is not about negativity per se, but on information that's outlying in terms of valence? So the uh, I, I've written about this with PJ Lamberson, uh, and there were hints about it in my in, in in the work that I presented here seven years ago. But this is not my idea. It's for, it exists from the 1960s onwards in psychology. It was prominent in work on impression formation, for instance. But it's not. Um, it hasn't really been demonstrated empirically. Uh, it was more 
kind of argued. And that simple argument was this, we're not necessarily interested in negativity. What we're interested in information that is that deviates from our preferences. We exist in very complex information environments. We can't pay attention to everything. We have to have some kind of fast mechanism for distinguishing between stuff that we have to pay attention to and stuff that we don't pay attention to. That is why our brain is hardwired to capture valence very quickly in milliseconds, capture valence very quickly, categorize based on that valence and direct attentiveness or not based on that valence. And if our expectation is mildly positive, and there are reasons in evolutionary psychology to expect our expectations to be to be mildly positive, if our expectation is mildly positive, then positive information is not as outlying as negative information. Negative information is further away, like a given unit of negative information and an equivalent unit of positive information. I don't know what those are, by the way. I don't know what equivalent means in that context. But these two units, the positive is going to be closer to the expectation than the negative. And as a consequence, the, that's kind of positivity offset produces a negativity bias. Okay, But uh, our expectations may change at different contexts. So we may have, we may be living in a context in which there is enough negative information that our expectation gets pulled downwards. And that then produces a more balanced a uh, focus uh, where attentiveness is concerned, but we may live in a sufficiently negative environment where our expectation changes. And, and this is the thing that PJ and I played with using formal modeling and then using um, some economic news content to show that when the economy is sufficiently negative, people start paying more attention to the positive information, not the negative information. Now, I think it's common to believe that this over time change is a slow moving process, but there are other and I think maybe more interesting accounts that suggest short term changes as well. So, for instance, there's work on the role that just novelty plays in our attentiveness and for, into information. Sometimes we just want a change of pace. We just want something different. We we that's why track four is a slower song after after three fast songs or why we look at different news after reading six stories about the pandemic, for instance. This kind of desire for novelty is well established in psychology and in information processing. Uh, and, and, and so, too, is the is, is the separate idea of kind of adaptive processing. Our use of positive information about a subject that is stressful in order to help us reason through, make sense of, and perhaps be more comfortable with that thing that should ring true in the midst of a pandemic. What is that thing? Well, one version is it's a pandemic. So our psychological processing of the pandemic involves our seeking out more positively balanced news about that pandemic. We read some negative stuff about the pandemic. We need a little bit of positive stuff about the pandemic to make sense of that. Uh, so, you know, we, we learn about Stanley Tucci making drinks at home or something. An another definition might be that that the thing isn't pandemic news, it might just be news generally. And so one of the ways in which we process negative news stories is to include a little bit of is to include a little bit of positive news too. Now, journalists own accounts suggest that some combination of novelty and adaptive processing matter for news production. I'm not going to focus on journalist interviews here. I, I'm, I'm not equipped. I don't have the skills to present interview data on, on slides. But we discuss in the book a series of interviews with television journalists, primarily in the Midwest and in Europe. And all of them talk about the use of positive content at the end of a television newscast as a way of either keeping viewers interested, that's about novelty, or about helping viewers feel better about the state of the world. That's about adaptive, that's about adaptive processing. And we, we are not like providing especially leading questions to the journalists. The question that they get is, it seems like television news always ends positive. Why? And then we just take what they what, what they give us. Now you might think. Okay, this notion that television news always ends positive, is that really true? Because it's, it's what we have thus far is largely anecdotal evidence. I think, I think probably, particularly for those of us in, in North America, it's pretty easy to, uh, to, uh, to convince you that news content tends to end positive. It does tend to end positive, not everywhere, but in, on many European uh, news channels as well. Lest you think we're describing an imagined tendency, however, rather than a real thing, Let's look at the actual tone of news coverage over a half hour news broadcast. Okay, so not all television transcripts come with the time that the individual stories aired, but we have a little under two years of ABC transcripts that come with the that that come with the the actual time between six thirty and seven that they aired. And so what we're going to do is we're going to take the stories that same stories that were part of the monthly trend before, but now we're gonna we're gonna just take all of those stories in this 
a 19 month period or so. And we're just gonna plot their tone based on when they started in the newscast from 6.30 p.m. to 7 p.m. in the newscast. And this is what that looks like. There are almost no negative stories starting after 6.55. Like you can, you can point, it might be too small for you, but I'm hoping it's not too small for you. You could point at this graphic and actually count the number of news stories there were in this 19 month period that were borderline negative and started after 6.55. There is a fundamental shift. Right? There is a, you can see there's like a commercial break. There's a commercial break and they come back with something positive. Driven by some combination of outlyingness or novelty or adaptive processing, and not just over the long term, the way we talk about outlyingness, but also over the short term, the way we talk about novelty, valence based biases and our attentiveness to information vary over time. That's point number one. Now let's talk about the second part of our argument, namely that valence-based biases vary across individuals. I'm gonna show you results from three past studies. So none of this is new data. It's all reanalyses of old data. The, uh, and and the, the first study, the, actually the, the, the first two of these were, were done with uh, colleagues in Montreal. And, and each of the three studies are gonna illustrate, I hope, that at any given point in time, there are individual differences in negativity biases. To be clear, context exerts uh, an, uh, an impact that's evident over time in our in our valence-based biases in information processing. But at any given point in time, there's also a lot of variation. So first here are results from a headline selection experiment run with Mark Tressler at the center. Um, and at the time, we used these data to explore the tendency for people to select negative headlines rather than positive headlines. And actually their tendency to do that, even when they said that they wanted, they wish news was more positive. So people's expressed preferences for news don't actually reflect their news reading behaviors. They say they want more positive news, but because of the way our brains are hardwired and because of the positivity offset, on average, humans will tend to select negative headlines more than positive headlines. That was the old story, but now I wanna, I, I wanna, I wanna fiddle with that story a little bit. You can see here, all, all I'm doing here is just taking all the headlines that were selected. So over the entire experiment, this is the distribution of negative, neutral, and positive headlines that were selected. And what I want to highlight here isn't the tendency for negative headlines to be selected at a rate that is greater than one, that is given the, so above one means given the number of head, negative headlines they were exposed to, they chose them at a rate that is 1.2 something, right? As opposed to less than one when presented with positive headlines, they chose them at a rate that is closer to 0 0.07. But if we look at these headlines, you can see that although the overall tendency leans negative, there are a lot of neutral and positive headlines selected there is a large minority of positive headlines selected. So at the time we were focused on the tendency for negativity, the tendency towards negativity. But what we masked was that there was still a strong minority of people picking positive headlines. Now you might say that's just noise. There's like people really prefer the negative stuff. They don't care about the positive stuff and there's just lots of error. But this same pattern is apparent across all kinds of different news sources, all kinds of different analyses actually, not just not just news sources. So now let's let's look outside the lab. Let's take the valence of every story that makes the top 10 most read stories in the New York Times over a two month period. So this is data scraped from the New York Times website, which just they used to have on the front page, they would say the top 10 most read stories, the top 10 most emailed stories, the top. So on. this is the top 10 most read stories. And what we do is grab that top 10 list and then grab the stories. And we do that every single day, okay, every, every single day. And this was for a piece in Public Opinion Quarterly that Yana, I, and others uh, wrote that was about the tendency for people to, the tendency for information to become more positive as we move into social media, because we can compare read stories to emailed stories, to tweeted stories and Facebook posted stories and, and so on. But that's not what I wanna focus on here. I wanna focus not on, the, not on the shift from negative to positive as we move from read to uh, to Facebook posted, I want to just focus on the fact that although lots of people are picking negative headlines, there are top 10 stories that are not negative. Our inclination towards negativity on balance is not overwhelming. There are a lot of neutral stories that are selected, 
that might be about some weakness in the sentiment measure. Maybe I, I'm not sure why so many in this case are neutral, although they may genuinely have been neutral. Keep in mind in this case, neutral can be, they were totally neutral or they just have balanced sentiment. They have as many positive words as they have negative words. And that might be part of, that might be part of what's going on here. But again, we see positive stories making the top 10. So it's not the case that uh, our negativity bias completely overwhelms the, the place for positive information. In fact, when I look at this, what I think of is, are, are those television news stories where the majority were negative and then there's like a little bit of positive? Or the experiments with Mark Trussler, where people are picking negative stuff, but they're also picking some positive stuff to go with it. And that's what we see in, the, in, his, in these observational data too. And it's also what Patrick and I saw in psychophysiological reactions to television news content. Now here, this is just uh, North American respondents. It's about 400, uh, it's actually uh, not North American, 400 respondents from the US, UK and Canada. And this is a measure of their, uh, of their tendency to be, to respond psychophysiologically in terms of skin conductance, to respond more strongly to negative information than positive information. And what you see here, and what Patrick and I saw over and over and over again in our many analyses, was a distribution which leaned on average negative, which is as we would expect, but for which a significant minority are, in this instance, to the right of zero. That is, we find that on balance, the average human is responding more strongly psychophysiologically to negative content. But there is, in every subsample of this experiment, a significant portion of people who are responding more strongly to that to, to positive information. And there are reasons to believe, again, that that's not just measurement error, because this variation is associated with other things. So there is, I think, when we look at lab-based experiments, we look at observational data about news reading, and then we look at psychophysiological reactions in the lab to televised news, there's good reason to believe that at any given moment, for whatever reason, there is a minority of people who are interested in positive content. That's argument number two. Recall that the third part of our argument is that technological change facilitates information consumption that is more able to respond to our valence-based preferences than ever before. So it makes sense for ABC News to target the median voter in the 1980s, the median voter who has a slight negativity bias. It might even make sense for ABC News to target them now, at least at the beginning, at least at the beginning of the news uh, newscast. But our news consumption habits can and have changed dramatically. And so let's consider what though these two sources of diversity, these two sources of variation in valence-based biases might look like as we move into a technological climate in which we are able to move between news sources and curate our own kind of distribution of information. Now, we, we can't quite, we, we can't quite show exactly what we'd like to show here. We're going to have to triangulate a little. We, we, we want to make the case not just that we fish around for information, but that we increasingly know where to find that information. So I'm going to start with the fishing around, and then I'm going to come a little bit close to the knowing. The fishing around is just based on some survey data from NORC, and they ask um, they ask people how many different technologies they use to um, to get the news, and then how many different sources. It's a kind of weird combination of technologies and sources. You can see them listed on the screen here. All I really care about is whether people use more than one. And so here's the distribution of listed technologies and sources amongst people. Every circle here is a respondent. And what I want to highlight is that the modal respondent is listing about five sources and about four technologies, right, when given the opportunity to pick some these sets of ways of thinking about getting at the news. It's just not the case that there are many people that go to one thing. Most people go to a bunch of things. Now, what I really like to do is to look at what exactly they're doing. Like, what is the path from one thing to another thing? And, and, and that's very difficult to get at. And we can talk afterwards about digital trace data if people are interested, but digital trace data also cannot get really what, what, what we'd like to get at. What I'd like to know is, what is it that you read first? And based on what you read there, what is your subsequent decision? And based on what you read there, what is your subsequent decision? And try to piece together a storyline that I think is relatively common about moving from one outlet to the next or one platform to the next. Maybe we start with the Washington Post and then go to Instagram to achieve our ideal balance and sentiment. 
right? It's a, it's like we need a break, we need some novelty, or we need a more tolerable balance of sentiment. And so after reading about the pandemic, we then go look at puppy dogs, for instance. Maybe we curate our social media feeds in ways that achieve a kind of balance of sentiment, highly positive or highly negative or somewhere in between, contingent or as part of our broader information environment. That is, our decisions about how we curate our Twitter feed may be partly contingent on our decisions about which newspapers we're reading in the morning or which television stations we're, we're watching in the morning or in the evening. These are all interrelated decisions. We are curating based on our cross-platform over time, over the course of the day or within the half hour experience, we're curating a kind of distribution of valence-based information that'll, that allows us to um, that, that allows us to kind of manage our day or manage the news or learn about the world or remain interested in the world. Now, I, we can't quite show that. We can't quite show that combination of conscious and unconscious decisions. I, I think that the, the decision to go to a different source for a different kind of information often is conscious enough that we can all think of instances when we've done this, like, oh, I just can't take this anymore. And we go to, we go to something else. Though this dynamic is, that, that, that as I've said, is hard to demonstrate empirically. Here's what we can do. We can point to work on valence-based homophily, suggesting that social media users tend to have stronger network connections with other users whose feeds exhibit similar distributions of valence, controlling for differences in topic interests and so on and so forth. So we tend to be drawn to a kind of social media stream that has a distribution of information that produces for us a distribution of information that is roughly similar to, to what we produce. There's a little bit of circularity there and there are reasons to think that what we're doing is learning to produce the thing which we're reading. I'm not sure I have any kind of strong causal claim there. Here's something else, here's something else we can do. Let's look at, um, let's look at Facebook content over a nine year period. We're gonna take the 500 or so most recirculated news providers on Facebook. Okay, we're going to scrape all their all their content. I'm using news providers very loosely here. We have a line in the book about how, like, uh, for instance, so a lot of crazy sources make the list. For instance, Jews News is not a list of helpful stories for Jews. It's not useful news at all. Um, so there's lots of uh, terrible stuff in here. But what I'm going to pick are five sources that are only partly terrible stuff, or rather, I'm going to pick, sorry, four plus four, I'm going to pick eight sources. And what we're going to do is look at sources that are widely known to be positive and widely known to be negative. And we're going to look at the impact that the valence of their content has on the number of times their information is recirculated on Facebook. And we want to make just the following very simple case. On average, negative news content gets recirculated on Facebook more. That's the overall finding that you're not seeing here. Here are four news sources, both neutral, conservative, and democratic, that tend to lean in the direction of negative content. In every single case, there is a negative coefficient for valence when we try to pre predict the number of times these things are recirculated. As in, amongst these negative sources, negativity pays off. They have an audience interested in negativity, that people are coming there for negativity. When they see the negative content, they recirculate that negative content. But that is not true for all sources. If we move to sources, neutral, conservative, and liberal, that are known for having positive content, that have a kind of expressed objective of producing positive content, we see that amongst the audiences for those positive sources, the positive content, you see the coefficient is flipped, the positive content is getting recirculated more. So there is a kind of valence-based homophily that is evident in social media data too, or rather it appears in social media data that um, you know, Facebook sites can foster audiences that are more interested in positive or negative content that audiences are able to curate news environments, which achieves their a balance of positive and negative content right, by identifying these expressly positive and neg negative news sources. And although we can only show it on Facebook, people are of course able to do this, not just on social media. We see it clearly there, but people are able to do this using their online and, and legacy media, television content, radio content, podcasts, that wouldn't be legacy, but podcasts and so on and so on, to find a distribution of information that suits their individual and time varying preferences for information. So that is our, our three part argument that it, it begins with the, I think the, 
I would say the recognition that valence, the valence of information is really central to how we select into or don't pay attention to information. By select into, I mean our brain tells us to pay attention to this piece of information. Our attentiveness to information and then the way in which we encode that information and the way in which we react that, to that information, political and otherwise, is first and foremost, first literally, like in the first milliseconds, first and foremost, driven by the valence of that information and thus by our preferences for valence or our expectations about valence at any given time. But our valence-based biases change over time and are in a sense self-correcting. When things get negative enough, we may start prioritizing positive information over negative information. Moreover, there is at any given moment in time, a lot of individual variation in valence-based news preferences. We've seen this across multiple studies. And we have a media environment that has, particularly over the past 20 years, but before that too, in the 90s with cable, for instance, developed in ways that more easily accommodate diversity in content and selectivity in how we construct our information environment. There are reasons it's now possible to be a news source that focuses on positive content, even though the average consumer, the average at any given point in time might lean a little bit negative. 40% of consumers at any given point in time might be more interested in positive content. And whereas ABC News in 1980 might not be able to target those people, abcnews.com now can very easily target those people. And so for all of those reasons, writing as we did in December 2020, but also I would say even now, there are reasons to expect the news environment to become on average more positive in the short term, it, given, the, um, uh, the, given the climate that we're in, and also given the changes in technology. There may also be reasons to expect the news environment to durably become more positive overall, since it's now better and permanently uh, more able to accommodate diversity and preferences rather than endlessly target the media and consumer. Now that, that argument, I think, has important implications for how we understand the news and, and, and the communication part of political communication. Uh, and, and probably, I hope, also some important implications for how we understand the political part of political communication, the ways in which the various ways in which we hold governments accountable, the nature of election campaigns, what we learn or don't learn about policy or the pandemic, or so on. But as you know, I, I, don't, I don't intend to get directly into that political stuff here. And so I'm going to stop there. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Stuart, um, for this super aggregate mega perspective uh, of your work uh, over the last years, kind of reanalyzing your work. Uh, from a different perspective. Um, I think that uh, we are now opening up uh, for questions uh, for those uh, who are interested and have them. And I take them in uh, various ways. Um, I will uh, feel them for Stuart so you can raise your hand. Uh, you can uh, write in the chat or you can also signal with your hand if you have your camera on and if I catch you um, while you do that. So uh, let's go here in the order that I received uh, the hand. So let's start with uh, Alison. So first, thanks. Um, I always love watching Stuart's talks because I learn a lot, but I also see how to do presentations better. So that's always uh, an advantage. Um, I had a question about whether or not the last point, the valence-based homophily, is something that is about individual heterogeneity, so that some people like more positive and some people like more negative, or if it's contextual. Sometimes I like more positive and sometimes I like more negative. And the difference between those two seem to be important for the last point, because it could be the same people who are more often sharing positive Huffington Post stories and more often sharing negative bright word stories. And so I'm wondering if you have a sense, either through your research or just intuitions of which of those is more likely or if it's both? Oh, that's a good question. Thank you. Uh, that, um, I would say that Patrick and I struggled for many years trying to figure out what it is that predicts the differences that we were finding psychophysiologically. And, and, it, and it 
my my best guess, and I think our best guess is that it's uh, you know really really hard to predict, and it's some combination of some kind of individual level baseline and some kind of contextually affected preference. It unquestionably is true that at different points it is the same people that are prioritizing positive or negative information and curating their Twitter stream on any given day by adding people or dropping people or reading something or just flipping by it and only barely reading it, curating on any given day based on what their preference has to be on that day. So I, I, I think the, it, I think probably the short version, like way shorter, like the 20 second version of what I just did for 40 minutes, the short version of the story would be something like for a whole range of trait and state level reasons, at any given moment, there is most likely a significant minority and quite possibly more than a significant minority that is interested in positive news coverage. And we are now entering a technological environment in which they are able to act on that and news agencies are able to cater to that. And as a consequence, what we see in news will change. That was not an answer to your question. Uh, thank you, Stuart. Um, Andre. Thanks a lot, Stuart. This is, uh, this is really stimulating. So I guess my question is about whether the same patterns apply to different topics. Would you expect the same patterns to emerge with sports, entertainment, mm -hmm. the economy, uh, politics? Uh, so I think I do. I'm stalling a little bit because when I gave a version, when I gave the prior version of this talk, you asked me a question about how do we, how do we maintain slightly positive expectations in politics, even though we're surrounded by negativity. And that question haunted me for five years. So I'm just, I'm trying to deal with this one now rather than have it hover over me. Uh, I think we know, I, I think that in communication, in the field of sports communication, we know that sports works differently. So I, 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 sports, there are all kinds of other considerations. And, and, and I, I think the sports folks would say, actually in sports, you really like positive information about your team. And if, and, if you're, and if your team is winning all the time, you're very happy to read winning all the time stories and you don't get bored of winning all the time stories. That's a bit of a different beast. But in, but in other domains, yeah, I expect there to be the same kind of variation in preferences over time. And be, and, and if you are, I'll add to that, if you are a fan of a sports team that is constantly winning or constantly losing, and you consume that information as part of your regular news consumption routine, I expect your experience with those constantly winning or constantly losing stories to have knock-on effects on your valence based preferences when you get to news. In other words, I think if your team is winning all the time, you can tolerate more negative news content, no more negative political news content, for instance. Whereas if your team is losing all the time, then you need something good to offset that. I have no way of showing that. Um, I, I want to tag on uh, one of my own questions here, uh, whether what we are seeing might be more a compartmentalization of Posit positivity and negativity for certain parts of our lives so such that we can end up with a very uh, negative expectation for negative political news but we are gaining all of our positivity from you know sports or if, if available and if not we, we go to the, the puppy route so uh, you know that that there is kind of a but but that so that doesn't really mean that the positive uh, development that you are expecting is is really touching uh, the political realm, for example. If we are compensating through the other areas. Yeah, that's true, and that that's making Andre's old question haunt me again. But yes, that that <laughs> that, that that could be that that could totally be true. As in, what we end up doing is not producing more positive what we traditionally call news content, um, but producing more positive content to offset news content that just stays exactly where it is. So it might be, for instance, that, that television news continues to look exactly the way it's always looked. And that what we see is movement in, in other sources on, on other domains. And there's a kind of interesting, I think maybe interesting discussion to have with news outlets about whether they're 
about the objective of, of being really, let's say in terms of valence, targeted in, in your audience, in finding your audience, like we're going to be a positive outlet and we're going to get, we're going to be upworthy and people are going to come to us when they need positive stuff, or whether your objective, I assume for large media outlets like ABC or like the New York Times or the Globe and Mail or whatever, their objective is probably to keep you on their site as long as they possibly can, in which case they have an incentive to produce that variation, that, that diversity of content them, themselves to keep you there as opposed to pushing you somewhere else. Now, whether they produce that variation in content by writing a positive story about healthcare, or whether they produce it by writing a positive story about, you know, how to make mixed drinks at home. I, I don't know. And no, but you, but I will note that on social media, the difference, it's becoming very difficult to say this is news content and this is not news content. I see. But it may just be that the category of news is is slowly getting erased. We used to talk about that like when presidents started going on on the on on the Tonight Show. But this is now we're in a totally different realm of thing. The example that I'm most interested in is uh, if I tweet that I just got a new job, is that economic news? I don't know. If all your if, if your Twitter connections are tweeting about losing jobs or getting jobs, that has to start mattering for your economic outlook. Mm. That to me is an interesting thought experiment. But um, I'm not sure I answered that question either, but the, there it is. Okay, thank you. Uh, I, I go down my list here, Fred. Thank you, Stuart, for that uh, very interesting presentation. It's a very attractive overview of, uh, of your book. Um, I have a question about the first argument and the uh, evidence you have presented. I remember in the old times, I, I, I did a dissertation about television programs. <laughs> I remember that you, you, you read that dissertation. And uh, in television studies, there's uh, an effect, uh, there's a literature about the, uh, the lead-in effect, which is one television program is scheduled in a such way that it's supposed to carry on the audience to the next television program. And <clears throat> when I see your graph, when I saw your graph about the valence of the news items from 6.30 to 7 p.m. My interpretation was that uh, the most negative news are maybe at the beginning of the newscast because one reason may be that we believe that such news items may lead the audience to the following ones. And because the most positive news are concentrated toward the end of the newscast, it seems to me that this piece of evidence is pretty against your argument on the uh, viability of good news, is it? That's a good question. and uh, and. I, I love that finding in your dissertation. Uh, I, I, it, so here's what I think. I, I think that um, we're not arguing here that positive news is necessarily, that people necessarily think that positive news is more important. And I, I think particularly given the objectives that we set out for media in representative democracy, and also the learned objectives of, you know, the kind of learned expectations about what comes at the beginning of a, of a major news program, what makes important news. I think it will always be the case that when we immediately turn to news, when we immediately look for the important facts of the day, those facts are gonna be negative content. Negative content because it requires a change in behavior, positive content does not. Negativity requires some kind of revision, negative piece of information, revision of what we already know, positive information tends not to. So our argument doesn't hinge on the expectation that people will start to think that positive information is more important. It hinges on the notion that at any given moment in time, some people just would like some positive information. They might know that it's important to know how many people are dying in the pandemic right now, that that actually is a more important piece of information than, I don't know, some positive story about 
I'll use like an example from the experiment, like about an old guy who builds a pool in his backyard so the neighborhood kids have somewhere to play. They might know that the pandemic story is more important, but what they what they would like is that old guy in the pool, or or they'd at least they'd like it. They'll take the pandemic stuff knowing that the old guy in the pool is going to follow after the pandemic stuff, or they're just tired of pandemic stuff. They opt right, you know, if it's online and they go right for the right for the pool story. It's not a revision in what we believe to be import, most important. It's a, it's the recognition that at any given point in time, people aren't selecting that information based solely on what they believe to be most important to their country or to the in the most important to their lives in the moment. It's what they what they it's, it's valence that they need in order to achieve a reasonable balance of positive and negative information in order to like wake up in the morning and vote or stay home during a pandemic or whatever. Thank you. Um, we uh, have uh, still uh, lots of people on the list. Uh, I'm, I'm going to Henry. Henry, uh, you have to unmute yourself. Yeah, okay. Um, I'm, not, I'm not sure this is entirely relevant, uh, but you know, my sense is that when Americans go for news, uh, it's not ABC, C, C, uh, ABC, CBS, NBC that they go to for news. It's uh, uh, CNN and uh, um, uh, sorry, uh, the right wing news channel, uh, <laughs> Fox. Um, I'm, you know, I think that. That the, the people that the that it's a different it's a different milieu it's a different reality uh, and I'm I don't I understand why you know CBS News like to have something positive at the end of the program maybe because they want to I don't know get people to watch the next show which is some kind of a comedy or game show or quiz show or something but I think people who are interested in the news as such. Are much more likely to go to CNN or uh, Fox, and and there, the negativity will be related to, uh, especially with Fox, the particular uh, content uh, of the story. Uh, if it's a conservative, pro positive story, then uh, Fox will uh, it'll be a positive report, and if it's a liberal, positive story, then it'll be a negative report, and. And the audience for Fox, at least, I think CNN is, you could probably say the same thing about CNN to some extent. And certainly to, what's that news, news uh, uh, channel on, on cable uh, with, uh, uh, what's her name? Uh, Well-known woman uh, opinion. Yeah. I, I'm not great on names these days, but I mean, I think, I think that's where, if you're interested in, in, in news stories in the sense of positive or positivity or negativity, uh, you, that's a whole dimension that you, that you don't touch upon. Uh, and I, I don't, in a sense, I, I think you're talking about the United States uh, 40 years ago before there was Fox and CNN and so on. Uh, I, I don't mean that as a criticism. It's just, I just wonder why it's all, why you ignore that whole dimension. Cable news networks all have lower ratings than the major three broadcasters in the US. The main sources of news, full stop, television, radio, and so on. The main sources of news are ABC, CBS, and NBC. They have far larger viewerships than the cable networks. And when Fox News talks about being the most watched cable network in, this, in the US, they always include the word cable because that's the only way in which it's true. So the, it's minorities that, let me just, the, it's minorities that are watching those other, those other networks. So on the one hand, we focus on ABC, CBS, and NBC in this work. I have other work that uses the, the other cable, the cable channels, but we focus on the big networks in this work because actually that is where the vast majority of people are getting their news. But there is a group of highly attentive news viewers, an, a, a relatively large minority of uh, highly attentive news viewers that are getting their news from CNN or from MSNBC, which leans Democrat, or from Fox, which leans very clearly um, Republican. And those news sources do change 
the availability of, in particular, negative information in, in, uh, in the kind of media environment. And as a consequence, shift our, should shift our kind of search for information in the kind of news ecology in which we exist. So one argument that I've played with is that actually the introduction of Fox and MSNBC, and they're both equivalently negative, by the way, if you do sentiment on these two, they look nearly identical. If, if you, if you, if you, get some of your news that with an introduction of Fox and NBC into your news diet might supply you with enough negatively valenced information that when you go to whatever other news source you are already used to consuming, you would like for that news source to be more positive than it used to be. Or you would look for the more positive content in that news source. So you introduce Fox into a media ecology and the Wall Street Journal might become more positive as a consequence. I think that's a really interesting that's a really interesting possibility. And this kind of view of news content of any one source as part of a broader news ecosystem, each piece of which is affected by the introduction or exclusion of another piece of that ecosystem, that I think is a really interesting avenue uh, for work, but not one in which uh, I'm not not when not an area in which I've played thus far, but we do have Fox and MSNBC and CNN over the same time period. I'll note that another problem, one of the reasons we don't include them here, is that they 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 aren't actually equivalent news programs. Whereas on ABC, CBS, and NBC, we can look to an evening or morning news program as the kind of television equivalent of a newspaper. MSNBC and Fox, for instance, do not have they don't have like six p.m. news programs. They don't have it. It's all talking heads now. So uh, the, it's a very different, it's a completely different kind of platform that doesn't make it not one interesting to study. It's super interesting to study and maybe more interesting because of that. It's just less comparable um, with, the, with television and, uh, and other, with television and, new, and, and newspapers. Thanks. Okay. Um, all right. Uh, thank you, uh, Stuart. And uh, we do have more people here with their hands up. Uh, Angus. Thanks so much, Stuart. Uh, really interesting. I'm still thinking through some of the, the stuff, but I think there's like, there's a lot of provocative things here. And I just have a few kind of general questions about different maybe dimensions to this. One is you talked sort of a lot about the demand side for negative and positive news, but I'm curious if there's a supply side effect and, and a mechanism could be something like, Journalists are spending a lot of time now on Twitter where there tends to be more negative information and they tend to receive more sort of negative feedback as opposed to positive feedback. So they, in their effort to balance their own sort of valence and positive negative information diet, then actively pursue positive stories. I mean, this is just a possibility, but this this sort of, I'm, I'm wondering if, if there's something going on there where, um, it's not just that media organizations are responding to demands, but they're also shaping them and maybe their own valence equilibrium seeking activities produce something. So that's sort of one possibility. Um, a second question just as sort of regards to um, the extent to which maybe like the, the segmentation of the news seeking population is going to radically affect these dynamics and sort of be the cause of it. So like I'm thinking of a particular population which is sort of opted out of news consumption and sort of tends to consume their information primarily through social media and relies on sort of this like network effect to provide them with news they need to know. This is sort of like that incidental exposure. If news is important, it will find me kind of attitude. And I'm wondering how this population and maybe some others that are that have become actually reasonably large populations in are going to affect sort of news consumption patterns, and um, I, I don't have a strong prior there, but I just 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 a thought as as you were talking. And my last comment, and this is sort of a little bit more like, uh, I mean, there's there's just this negative positive binary, and I'm I'm really worried about. I, you know, I get that for dictionary based approaches, and I've used them as well, like in my own work, that there's that binary. And maybe there's this neutral category, which you know is made up of a whole bunch of things. So we tend to kind of ignore it a little bit. Is that really a useful way to look at news today? And 
I'm thinking of some sort of specific examples where you could say like a story could be positive for one population, but negative for another population and a valence like dictionary based detection won't pick that up. So like, here's an example, like large Black Lives Matter protests, you know, rampage through downtown and ground the city to a halt. Is this a negative piece of news or is this a positive piece of news? Well, if if you're a Republican who doesn't like Black Lives Matter, that might be negative. But if you are a pro Black Lives Matter um, individual, then you might see this as like an outpouring of support. And so in fact, that's a positive piece of news. And you're not gonna pick that up with sort of like this clear binary between the negative and positive. Anyways, that's just a few few initial thoughts. And, you know, pick and choose whatever you wanna to reply to. <laughs> uh, we've seen movements in, in journalism uh, at various times, particularly over the past 15 years, and actually a lot in response to like, how do we cover Donald Trump? We've seen efforts in uh, in journalism to try to figure out how to produce a journalism that is that attracts attention and that isn't so oh, let's say too pessimistic, like that offers some kind of actionable items. That's the things that you can that that you can do. And I, I think there are certainly um, I hope that there are things that journalists do that affect demand, like the supply of a, if information will then produce demand for that thing. I see this as reciprocal, that, that journalists are acutely aware of what people are interested in, more so than ever before, right? Even newspaper journalists know how many people read their stories. There are newspapers in which the newsroom has like a top 10 stories on the website right now. So they get very, very quick feedback on, on what's getting, on what's a hit. And, and, and what's not, they're adjusting what they do accordingly. And then what they do affects what's available to the people and thus their choices and so on and so on and so on. I see that as a reciprocal, uh, as a reciprocal link, not just about what people want. Um, I tend to emphasize the what people want part, partly because I think that older media studies like 20, 30 years ago, tended to focus on, a, tended to have a very kind of top-down view of media, that journalists do this thing they're mean and they say mean things about politics. And so that's what we get to read. And that's not a view I subscribe to. Um, the news finds me argument. And, and so I think my colleague, Brian Weeks would say actually that news finds me stuff does not seem to be true as in news does not find them. <laughs> Although that might be an approach <laughs> people take to news that does not seem to be empirically true. Um, and uh, you know what they mean for content is that's really interesting. And, and I think a lot of social media companies, well, a lot of social media, the four social media companies uh, are, are grappling all, all the time with how to come up with the right mix of the stuff that you want in your feed and the stuff that they think you might need in your feed, like where to get the COVID vaccine, for instance. Um, and that, that I think is a regular concern. I don't have any, I have no useful thoughts on that other than to say that unquestionably matters to the way in which news aggregators are managing or information aggregators are managing their news content, but I don't, it surely matters, but in ways we, we don't yet understand. The positive negative binary, I mean, I've not seen it as a binary, right? It's an interval level measure for me always, a, a kind of range. So it's not either positive or negative, it can be both. And there is this in-between place where it's awkward, as in where we can't distinguish valent, completely unvalenced information from equally positively and negatively valenced information using the measure I presented today. Although we can absolutely allow for positivity to be uh, measured separately, let's say orthogonally from negativity, which some psychologists would argue is necessary. And we can look at the differential impacts of positive and negative stuff independent of each other and thus identify instances in which any kind of valence, positive or negative or a combination thereof drives for instance, social media attention. And I think when we look at positive and negative separately, we do get some interesting stories in, 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 um, in social media about whether it's positive, negative, or just the existence of um, valence. And then after that, the existence of affect and emotion that drives positive or negative, that drives um, social media reactions. And I say after that purposefully to lead to the next thing, which is I don't, I'm not actually principally worried about whether positive or negative is, a, is, is the ideal way in which to categorize news content. What I care about is that this positive negative dimension is most likely the way in which your amygdala responds to information coming in. So we'd like to find some, that, that still leaves us with measurement problems, like how to measure valence in content, 
But this kind of very basic positive negative dimension is central to the way in which we react to information in the first few milliseconds in which we, it, we receive it before we get to the point of having, let's say emotions, even before we get to the point of having emotions about that piece of information, affect and emotions, which would come subsequently to this initial valence-based instant, almost instantaneous reaction that um, appears to be fundamentally just about a very simple positive negative dimension. Something very simple, not necessarily the best way to categorize information, but something very fast. It is our initial reaction to information, one that then becomes more reasoned uh, over the subsequent milliseconds. So, sorry, sir, I'm just curious. What do you think about the example I raised there? Like, do you think that you would have a different uh, amygdalic response between different partisans to to like that type of headline around? Yes, right. And just say yes. Unquestionably, you have a the, that any people come with different biases and different expectations, and then all the other variables that matter to whether they see something as positive or negative. Right. So some information is objectively positive or negative. Uh, I don't know children dying, unemployment going down. The second ones of there might be some people who are who, who don't like that, but uh, I mean, there, there are some cases that, that are very clearly positive or negative. And then there are cases which are only positive or negative based on your partisanship or your group identity or a range of, or, or a range of other factors. And, and that's not easy to get at in the kind of story that I'm telling today. Uh, it's not easy to demonstrate with the data I'm using today, I should say. But we can imagine how this story still holds for someone with a given other set of biases layered on top, or beliefs or identities layered on top of this kind of state and trait driven uh, valence based preference. That if you also have strong liberal partisanship, then there's a given set of information that for you will immediately be. Um, be identified as positive or negative. Just like if you go for a sports team, there's a given thing that will immediately be for you very positive or very negative. Whereas for someone else, it might be the opposite or if someone else it will be, they don't care what happens to the nets. Thank you. Uh, so I just wanna say that, that we are officially kind of at the end of our kind of informal time that we don't really have a time frame completely stacked out but for those who need to leave of course they they should leave but Stuart do you still have a few minutes so we can discuss the last questions here or I'm not allowed out of my house Dylan I have nowhere to go <laughs> I thought that uh, is not the case right now anymore um, <laughs> um, but uh, so so let's let's get to the last questions then that that's uh, very generous of you uh, Stuart so Isadora Thank you, Stuart, for the talk. Um, it was a little hard to not, to put aside the political science sort of expectations, right? So um, so I'll, I will kind of pivot to a different yeah. area of just personal interest um, that relates to Angus's point about the dictionary-based detection method um, critique. Um, so some research has found um, that people who watch these satire shows, new like the sort of the growth of this sort of like infotainment category that you mentioned that kind of blurs the lines between um, politics and not, or news and you know hard news or whatever you would call it. Um, and so some of this research found that um, there was more co more correct political knowledge recall among viewers of um, of these shows, which you. You know, I, as far as I know, there isn't any, there isn't such a thing as right wing satire. So there are also left leaning um, programs, right? So, um, so the question is, what role do you think these um, these types of programs um, play in the in your valence sorting method? Um, because it is based on a lot of satire. So, you know, can you pick up on, you know, um, clearly negative stories or, uh, you know, I, I wouldn't even know how to, how to categorize something like, you know, satire or irony 
um, you know, I think that's something, an, a bit of an issue in the text analysis world, right? Um, uh, even picking up on irony in text. So, um, you know, that it's not, you wouldn't really find it in the, the, the sources you've talked about today. The, you know, you wouldn't find it in Breitbart or New York Times or Huffington Post, but a lot of people are getting their news from TV shows that use this kind of language. So I, if you could speak to that a bit. There's a lot in there. So on the, on the content analysis side, you're right, the single best way to deal with irony or satire where automated content analysis is concerned is to pick sources in which there is no satire. In which there, because you just, we, we can't do it. Oh, my camera is about to die. I'm gonna have to, I'm gonna have to switch a battery or something. Uh, I might run out quickly if my if my battery dies. Um, the there we are. <laughs> Give me one second. Um, so on the content analysis side, we can't identify satire, and the best way to do it is to not have to do it, um, unless you're going to do it with humans. There is this general issue with satire, like dating from work in the '70s on All in the Family which is probably before your time. But um, the argument there is that part of the problem with having an effect, at least in entertainment, where satire is concerned, is that because it's not obviously joking, people who agree with it, as in people who agreed with Archie Bunker, who was conservative, and he was supposed to be making fun of a conservative position. People who agreed with Archie Bunker just thought, yeah, that Archie Bunker, he knows what he's talking about. They didn't see it as satire. And there's evidence that people saw the same uh, believe the same about Stephen Colbert's previous show, for instance, that there were conservatives who watched it and just regarded it as a, um, like that he's right. So, so the, the impact of satire uh, can be complex. And then there is the issue of whether some version of infotainment or what have become these late night satire programs, how they factor into the way in which we understand the news. And the, I think that my view of the literature is that for the most part, the people who, who are getting their information from those shows are not exclusively getting their information from those shows. So they are getting some information that, that, isn't, uh, that isn't coming from Jon Stewart or coming from, um, coming from Stephen Colbert or whatever. But um, so that's uh, probably not all their information is coming in that form. But actually the most interesting part of what you're talking about is the possibility that people are able to get at least some of their information in a tone that is different from what the news would be, or to finish their day on a tone that is more happy and uplifting. And I think there's an argument to be made that uh, I have not thought about it all until right the second, so I could be totally wrong, but my guess is there is an interesting argument to be made about the tendency for those satire shows to come late in the day in the US after the news not in the Canadian case, but in the US, these are coming in after the news. Um, the 11 o'clock ones, like the Daily Show, for instance, comes immediately after the news. So they are a post news, more positive take, generally more positive take on the bad, negative state of the world. Positive, not because they are giving you happier stories, but because they are talking about those negative stories in more, in funnier ways. They're allowing you to laugh at those negative stories. Dana Young has a terrific book, by the way, called Irony and Outrage, in which she talks about um, the wh why satire only works for liberals. Hmm. Hmm. Okay, thanks. Thanks for that recommendation. But um, okay, thanks. Okay, next is uh, Olivier. Hey, uh, thanks a lot for your talk. Uh, I was looking at the figure showing the. Uh, individual level choices in uh, the news that's being selected, whether positive or negative. And to me, it, it appears that there, there are two stories are here that are observationally equivalent when looking just at a snapshot in time. The first, which is, I think, the, the story that you were emphasizing, which is uh, there are people who consistently prefer negative stories, people who more or less consistently prefer positive stories, and people who select somewhat neutral stories. But it seems to me that there's an, an alternative, which is that some people consistently choose neutral stories and some people have, let's say, uh, unstable emotional states and they sometimes prefer very negative uh, stories and sometimes prefer uh, very positive stories. And so the, the, over time, the people who are selecting these highly uh, high valence stories are the same, they're just switching positions. Uh, is there 
any that anything that may be true about this argument. It's pure conjecture, but I'm just wondering if, if there's anything anything to, the, to that. Thanks. The short answer is I don't know, uh, but my intention wasn't to argue that there are people that there are any, that there's anybody necessarily with a stable preference. I, we all have varying preferences. We're all unstable. <laughs> we all have. We may have some baseline preference. We probably do. All have a different baseline preference. That in at the point of like zero input, I have a slightly different preference than you, than Dietland, and so on. But but those preferences are constantly changing and updating based on context and on what we're reading and on what we've just consumed. And uh, and as a as a result. At any given moment, it's unclear whether we're observing somebody's baseline preference or observing their preference in the moment. This argument is central to a piece that Patrick and I wrote, in which we're, uh, along with John Hibbing and Leela Kinnear, in which we were trying to figure out like what to make of the psychophysiological response that we get in a lab. How much of that is your your like trait level? valence based bias and how much of that is your state level like it's just like it's in the moment in this like on this day you had to run to the lab mm -hmm. and the running to the lab changed your mood and that changes your reaction my my guess i don't know what, what patrick's position would be on this my, my guess is that it's a lot of like whether you ran to the lab or not it actually is a there's a there is a trait level there is a state level difference there is a trait level difference but a lot of it's governed by states there aren't this stable group of people that are in the middle or this stable group of people that are uh, on the positive side or on the negative side. We all achieve some distribution of valence. We're all interested in some distribution. Okay, um, I think we are at the end of uh, our questions. Uh, I, I just wanna say, uh, because uh, I mean, I do have my questions too but uh, I, I don't wanna extend the talk unnecessarily, but I was very impressed with the overtime data that you showed in the very beginning, that there is no event and not even the COVID crisis that would be pushing the level of negative news uh, consumed and, and produced, I guess, in your case, uh, down uh, to, to, to a low valley. And, and, and by therefore also shifting everyone's expectations down for a longer period of time. It seems like that there have been these downward shifts, but that they have been followed up again with, uh, you know, uh, uh, movements in the opposite direction. So is, is it just a matter of, I mean, is, is that the law that you subscribe to that that you would say it will be there, whatever event we look at, or if we take a even farther expanded time period that there will be other events that that will have maybe sh shifted the overall acceptance of, of negative news? Uh, Almost and always, yes. Okay. Uh, so the reason news is it looks not overwhelmingly negative in April and May of 2020, even though we all remember feeling really sad at the time, yeah. is because we felt sad at the time. And thus mm -hmm. we're looking for information, yeah. a distribution of information that was less negative. So it, it is our, our, our mood, our sense of the context at the time is what shifts the balance of news coverage. There is this kind of self-correction. Now, yeah, there so are been, unquestionably I'm... moments where that's not true, right? If we, if we, if a civil war starts tomorrow, hmm. I'm not arguing that news is going to get positive two weeks later. I'm pretty sure the news is going to be bad for the duration. And I, I, I have no direct experience with those kinds of situations and nor do I have news data from those kinds of situations to play with. But except in those very outlying moments, outlying is not the word to use given that I use outlying in a different way, but in those kind of very rare moments, there are probably a different rule applies. Right, right. I mean, I, I guess I was asking about these moments that could shift our natural affinity to snap back which, which is mm. something that you find um, and, and whether there could be this negative or potentially also positive spiral. But anyway, that's for another talk and therefore we will uh, look forward to that. Uh, but thank you very much for uh, today's uh, talk. I, I think I talk in the name uh, of uh, everyone here that uh, we tremendously enjoyed this really comprehensive view of, of your work <laughs> and uh, thank you that's kind. Very Thank much, you. Stuart. That was very inspiring. Thank you. Thank you for having me. It's a real pleasure to see everyone, and I'm really grateful for the advice. Thank you. <laughs>